So with that, please join me in welcoming Jeffrey and Drew. Now, most people don't know that the Depression of 1921 was such a, such a huge economic problem. GDP declined a third in 1921, a third. But they, they let it happen. They, they, they forced all of the bad debts and bad investments to get liquidated. And so they actually raised interest rates and cut government spending, and the economy collapsed. But the reason that nobody knows about the Depression of 1921 is that's the right thing to do. Mm. You take the pain. Because by 1923, everything was going swimmingly again. And it's so, a quick turnaround. And when the, when, the, when the Depression came in the early 30s, they did the opposite. And the Depression went on and on and on. Mm. So the, this is a metaphor for our times, because in my career, which is over 40 years, increasingly when we hit economic hard times, first of all, the recessions seem to be getting worse every time. And that's, that's not... That's not a coincidence. It's because they try so hard to stave them off, kick the can down the road. Right. Right. And so what, we're do- what we did last time with zero interest rates, negative interest rates on a sustained basis, this is terrible policy. And we're running an economy that's supposedly good with a, with a $2 trillion budget deficit. When the, when the recession comes, the budget deficit will go up because taxes go down and, you know, uh, transfer payments and uh, uh, unemployment benefits, stuff like that, go up. And so in recent recessions, we've had the, the um, budget deficit increase by, on average, the last three recessions. Now, this is distorted meaningfully by the last one, which was so unusual. But the budget deficit's gone up 9% of GDP on average. If we take out COVID, we could say it's maybe you know, 7% of GDP. But if we tack on 7% of GDP to our budget deficit in the next recession, you're talking about something like another twenty two and a half trillion. So now it would be a four and a half trillion dollar budget deficit. And and it's coming out now. In fact, we were just talking about this just came up yesterday in our investment teams meeting. Interest rates have started to rise. They're going up in Europe. They're going up here. And a lot of people are now the, the narrative is starting to develop. This developed yesterday. Why? What was the catalyst for rates to go up meaningfully? between last Friday and yesterday. And the reason that people are toying with is they're saying people are worried about all of this debt and how are we going to finance it? And because of this, I I think the most important investment concept is that what you think you know, well, put it this way, experience might not be a positive at this moment because you have experience like I do you think you know how relationships work. You think you can map past economic uh, experiences to the present. But I would add one note of caution on doing that. Four years into 2021, there was nothing but falling interest rates. Yes, they went up sometimes, but out of general sense, trending, secular trend, from 15% rates to 0.2. And so people think that they understand what happens during a recession. I don't think that's going to work because I don't think we have falling interest rates anymore. You know, in, in 2022 into 2023, interest rates went from sub 1% to over 5%. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that some of the relationships that have been so helpful until 2021 are completely backfiring. I invented something that is now so somewhat famous in the industry, the copper-gold ratio. Take the price of copper and you divide it by the price of gold. And for 40 years, it was an excellent starting point on where should 10-year treasury rates be. And it was almost identical all the time if you, if you lined them up. And any time there would be a divergence, it was temporary, and they'd, they'd go back together again. That, that indicator is completely non-helpful ever since 2021, end of 2021. The 10-year Treasury rate is up at, I don't know, four and three quarters or so. Let's just call it 5%. And the copper-gold ratio says that the 10-year Treasury rate should be below one if you use that ratio. Why is that happening? I think it's because we're not in, there's something different about secularly rising interest rates versus falling. So people used to buy, you know, people... Gold used to be, oh, uh, you know, there's 
there's deflation, I don't want gold, there might be inflation, I want gold. It would be, uh, it, would, it, it had some sort of a connection that people were buying it out of speculation or something. Now I think people are buying gold out of almost permanent asset allocation. They're worried. Mm -hmm. They're worried that our, our institutions are imploding. They're worried that nobody can get along. They're worried that we have, uh, we're, we're involved in two significant wars. It's going to be three soon. You know, they're, they're worried that we have this massive budget deficit. We're worried that, that it looks like there's meddling around in elections. It looks like the DOJ, the CIA, I mean, all of them. They all seem to be invested in sort of tipping the scales of things. And I think people are, are worried about that, and they're worried about inflationary policy. Because when the next recession comes, I don't know what else they're going to do except the old game plan. Mm -hmm. And the old gay plan is you collapse interest rates and you borrow a ton of money. But I, I think actually, the, I, I predicted when the 10-year treasury was above 5% that we'd go down into the mid threes. And I got roundly criticized for that, but I was right. But I thought that it would do that because when weakness started to materialize, people would say, oh, I've seen this movie before. Kind of gets weak, rates fall. So you make money on bonds and, they would, they, and that happened. But I think now the next stage is when the recession comes, they'll say, we're going to, we, we can't finance this stuff. So there was a moment in the UK three years ago where they, they had to sell some bonds and there was some sort of policy that was being uh, considered that investors balked at. They didn't like the concept. And overnight, the interest rates went up on the long-term uh, gilts the UK bonds, they went up by 150 basis points overnight, which is a massive loss. I mean, you're talking about a 30% loss overnight. And then they, they said, so we were only kidding, sorry about that. And so the rates moderated and it started to come down. But what happens if the US has that happen? Um, that's going to re reveal a lot of problems. So I'm strongly of the opinion that if interest rates have secularly bottomed, I think that they're going to be secularly rising. And, you, and some of the relationships from the past will be exactly the opposite mapping into the future. People say in recession, the dollar goes up. I think the dollar's going to go down in the next recession. In, the, in, in recessions, emerging markets greatly underperform the United States stock market. I think it's going to be the opposite. Because when the dollar is, is, is going down, 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 if you're a dollar-based investor, you want non-dollar investments. Because ironically, something like uh, I don't know, the peso might actually hold better value. And so one more thing, corporate bonds. People think they understand how corporate bonds work, you know, that they start defaulting when the economy is bad, but then, you know, there's a period of trouble and then it kind of dissipates. Well, that's historically has been because the companies that were getting closer and closer to bankruptcy were able to kick the can down the road by refinancing, even though investors demanded more yield premium from junkier bonds, the base rate off which they're compared, the treasuries were lower. So companies that had borrowed at 8%, so rates on treasuries fall 300 basis points, spreads widen out by a couple percent, they still can refinance at seven. They can't do that now because even though rates have come down, a great quantity of, of lower quality uh, bonds were issued where the interest rate they were paying was three and a half percent. You will never have those interest rates on, on particularly the lower quality bonds. They'll never see 3.5% again. So th that, this time, when the trouble comes, there's going to be a much higher default rate than what we think we know from experience. You know, what, the best trade I ever did in the business was very early in my career. It was actually my first year. And the, the market was going up, 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 up. Interest rates were going down from 15. They went down to 7 and I, was, I thought it was kind of a mania, and I s sold long-term treasury bonds. I was, I was, I was amazing. I, I, had, I, had like, I had been on the job six months. I had almost no experience. I sold them, and as luck had it, it turned out to be the absolute top tick. It was the top tick. Nobody sold at a higher price. And, se and uh, four months later, the, the, the rates, I sold them at 7%. Four months later, they were at 1043 and I was, even when you're young, you know, you just want to, want to beat your drum and stuff like that, toot your horn. 
And so I was talking to this guy who was, uh, he was uh, his, someone who I would talk to on the phone. He was, he was a broker. And I told him, you know, I sold it at like seven, I sold on the top tick. And he goes, I don't mean any, you know, I don't mean to be insulting, but that's because you have no experience. <laughs> <laughs> and I now know that he's right. Because experience can, can make you uh, ossified in your thinking. Right, you're, you're not you're not open, or you're, you're, you're from experience you you second guess things. And I was just saying, you know, I was looking at charts, and it was the Japanese buying, and it was all this, all this weird stuff going on. And so I sold it, and it, it was the greatest great, greatest trade of my life. And the guy was right; it's because you don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get back to the art in just a minute. But speaking of falling rates, I'm I'm sure a lot of people in the room are dying to know. I mean, what is your what is your hypothesis on how many rate cuts we're going to get by end of year? What do you think that's going to look like by the end of the year? Mm-hmm. I, I I think probably one at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, I, they're definitely dialing back. This this has been one of the most volatile year for Fed expectations that I've ever seen. We entered this year with the consensus betting that the Fed would cut rates two and a quarter percent, seven twenty five basis point cuts during twenty twenty four. And then by the end of March, there had been a scare of a little bit of inflation coming back, mm-hmm. which one thing I want to tell people, you know, investment people, the CPI is seasonally adjusted, but they do a very poor job of it. So there's an ongoing pattern perennially of the first quarter surprises on the upside, the second quarter surprises, but not by as much as the first quarter, and the third and fourth quarter surprise to the downside. So that first quarter surprise hit, and suddenly people were like, there aren't going to be any rate cuts this year. So we went from seven to nearly zero. I think the betting was like one half of one cut, so almost nothing. And then all of a sudden, things were looking weak again, and we had, we had some bad job reports, we had some revisions that went down, and all of a sudden, it went to, not for the year 2024, but for the ensuing 12 months, there, would be, there was a moment where they said there would be 10 cuts, 250 basis points. And then the Fed panicked because the market was pushing rates down, and they, 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 don't, look, they don't like it when there's a big gap between their overnight rate and the two-year treasury rate. They follow the two-year treasury. We don't need the Fed. We need a Bloomberg terminal because the two-year treasury, <laughs> the, blo- 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 the two-year treasury leads the Fed. They deny it until they're, until they're blue in the face, but they're lying. They do follow the two-year treasury. And we had a very big gap. And so I predicted uh, t- two days before the Fed, last Fed meeting, I said they're going to cut by 50. And that was the, before the July 31st Fed meeting. They're, they're, they're going to cut by 50. And, and they did. And so now uh, we've had better jobs reports. I, I, think, they're, I think they're inflated. There's a, there's a lot of statistics that look like they're being manipulated. So th- another thing you can't have confidence in. Because there's two different job reports. One is the establishment. That's the one that comes out the first Friday of every month and gets all the attention. That's been revised down so many times in the past couple of years. There's a yearly revision. The most recent one, they knocked off 818,000 818, uh, jobs. So it was like almost a million jobs. And so the initial numbers are no good. There's, there's another one that's called the household survey, which at economic turning points is more accurate than the establishment survey. The household survey has, for the first nine months of this year, cumulatively, no job gains, job losses, cumulatively, for nine months from on, on, on full-time jobs. It's been negative every month. And then you get to part-time jobs. They've been up and down, but they're also negative in terms of job growth uh, year-to-date. So I, I'm wondering why there's this divergence between these two surveys. But um, I, I do think the Fed will probably cut rates uh, simply because the two-year Treasury remains well below 4%. Mm-hmm. And they're up at 4 and, se- four and 7 eighths. So they probably will cut rates unless the market backs up further. And there's not much time left because the, it's only two weeks to the next Fed meeting. But one other thing about the Fed funds rate, we, can, we also can compare it to the longer-term interest rates, like the 10-year interest rate. And the gap between the Fed funds where it was at five and three eighths and the 10 year was the largest in the history of the U.S. financial markets. It had never been that the 10 year was so low compared to the Fed funds rate and by a huge magnitude. And so 
the, that, to, that to me f further suggests that you, know, that you have some catch up work to do. Last thing, the Fed, the Fed uh, cut rates by 50, but in the preceding meeting, there was, the, well, I'll say this, from the meeting before where they did nothing to the 50 basis point cut, the two year treasury rate went uh, down by 62 basis points. They cut by 50. What that means is however far behind the curve they were July 31st, they're further behind the curve now. Hmm. Now, rates have backed up a little recently, but a, a, as of the last Fed meeting, they were actually getting further behind the curve with that 50. So we'll see what happens, but the Fed will, the Fed's going to be cutting rates. Um, a lot of people are worried that inflation isn't dead yet. Uh, I'm, I'm not really in that camp. I, I, we've, we've been pretty good on, on the inflation forecast. And we think we're going to be living in somewhere below 3% on the CPI, at least until the middle of next year. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that, will, that should give the Fed further confidence. So I, I really don't like longer-term Treasury bonds. Mm -hmm. I've, I've actually done some pretty dramatic things to protect my clients from what I fear could be one of these uh, crazy uh, responses to a situation. We've seen a lot of crazy responses in the last, I would say, 20, 20 years, 25 years maybe. One of the first ones was in the early 00s, the auto industry was heavily over leveraged and they got into trouble. Um, Ford actually went bankrupt and GM was on the edge of bankruptcy and GM had a lot of debt and some of it is senior to others, the way the, the bond market works. And what they did, the government did, is they bailed out the GM pension system by putting the GM pension system as the most senior part of the capital structure in front of the senior secured bondholders. They're, by law, at the front of the bus, but they subordinated them to the pension system. Those bonds just collapsed in price. That's an Ill illegal thing to do, but they did it for probably you know, voter block reasons. And then we had the mortgage problem you know, all those ridiculous pick-a-pay mortgages and no money down and all that stuff. And uh, those lo loans were, in, a couple trillion of them, were packaged into securities. They were bundled and sold off as publicly traded securities. And there's prospectuses for these securities, and the prospectuses said these mortgages cannot be modified. The terms of the mortgages, the, the interest rate and, and the maturity cannot be modified under any circumstances. That's what it said in the prospectuses. And a lot of p investors trusted those assurances. I was not one of them. Trusted those assurances. And so when it got really bad and it looked like you were going to have en masse defaults because people, the housing prices dropped 35% and pe people were doing 100 LTV, they said, wow. we're going to modify them. Yeah. And there were all kinds of uh, investment companies that threatened to sue them. But you can't sue the government. It's not going to. It's not going to work. Yeah. And so they did, they just rolled over and said, "Okay, that was illegal." And then, but they did it. And then, in 2020, in response to the lockdowns, the corporate bond market was collapsing. It is illegal for the Fed, by the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, which was made in Jekyll Island, at John Albright's place. Right? It's illegal for the Fed to buy corporate bonds. And in the global financial crisis, I know some people who were at the Fed at the time. She said they had heated debates about should they ignore the law and buy corporate bonds, and they collectively said, we just can't do that. Mm. This time, they did. So now the Fed illegally bought some corporate bonds. It turned out they didn't have to buy very many. It was just the threat, right? Because the prices went down by 40%, and the Fed shows up and says, oh, don't worry about it. You know, we're, we're, we're buying them back at face value. And so suddenly, suddenly the prices went up by, you know, many percentage points in, in just a few weeks. So what happens when the problem that even the politicians are now talking about, we got this interest expense problem. Four years ago, the interest expense for the federal government was $300 billion per year. Today, it's $1.3 trillion and rising straight up. So, and the reason for that is there are $17 trillion of bonds maturing between this year, next year, and 2026. 17 trillion. And the average interest rate on many of those bonds have interest rates. Well, they take the five years that were issued in, in 2019. They had an interest rate of 
that interest rate is, is lower than it was a little while ago, but it's up near five. So you're looking at a 17 trillion. Now, not all of them are at that low of a rate, but the, I, would, I would argue that the, the rate that's on average is probably about three. So, if you, t- so still, even though we're is- issuing bonds at around 4% now, it's still going up. So people are talking about this interest rate problem. Well, what happens in the next recession when the deficit goes up to $5 trillion? And there's, somebody says, I am not buying 3% bonds where you're issuing $5 trillion of them and you're running an inflationary policy through deficit spending and no doubt, at least initially, lower interest rates. I think there's going to be the potential for a failed auction. And so one of the things I did, I, 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 I said to myself, what, oh, lay back up. There's two non-controversial pillars of investing money. The first is don't take a risk unless you get paid something for it. Pretty non-controversial. Another one is if you can eliminate a risk at very little or no cost, eliminate the risk. So uh, this all came to me. I was actually in Toronto, and where I'm going tomorrow, and uh, I was thinking to myself, you know, why don't we keep our maturity structure exactly the same in our treasury bonds, but swap the ones for, say, we buy have a 20-year, we'll sell our 20 years and buy the one that has the lowest interest rate, the lowest, you know, coupons, we call it. And it took us about two weeks because we did it stealthily. We didn't want this to get out because we would, we would be trading against ourselves. And within a couple of weeks, we got our longer-term bonds from a coupon of four and three quarters down to a coupon of about one and a half. Now, I'm not predicting that this is going to happen, but if you can eliminate a risk at no cost, do it. And in this case, I eliminated a risk at negative cost because what this swap from one to the other with the same maturity actually created a slightly higher yield mm. because they were, they're, there's a, they're, they're what we call off the run. They're less liquid. So now if they announce, well, since we can't afford what's now our 4% interest expense on $40 trillion of bonds, we're going to do a little switcheroo. We're going to say that if the interest rate that you, your bond contractually pays is higher than one, it's now one. And if your interest rate you're paying is less than one, it stays where it is. Well, since the interest expense might be at 4%, then if you take it down to just round numbers one, you just cut the interest expense by 75%. That's a beautiful way to kick the can down to the next administration, down to the next Congress, down, right? Because, and everyone will cry, you know, bloody murder, except me, because I'll be sitting there saying, wow, we're heroes. Because there will be people that have 30, 40, 50% losses overnight if this happens. Mm. I, will it happen? I think this is a Byron Wien surprise thing. There's a guy named Byron Wien who was a legend in the investment business. At the end of every year, he would put Byron Wien's 10 surprises for the new year. And he used to explain it by saying, I don't believe these are 50% plus chances. I just believe that the chances of these things happening is higher than what the consensus believes. So he would look for ideas that he thought had maybe a 30% chance of happening that most people thought had a 5 or 10% chance. And he would be right on these things, you know, maybe a 3 out of the 10, 4 out of the 10. That's what I think of here. Will it happen? I don't know. But eliminate a risk at no cost. So where are you positioned on the yield curve? Um, actually, uh, I've, uh, I've in and out of being short long-term bonds. And I, I get the interest rate exposure by buying two, three, and five year. And so I'm actually have, have a, a pair trade. So I'm actually, actually short at the present moment, 20 and 30 year treasury bonds. And I'm long twos and threes on a leverage basis. And this, is, this has not worked in the past few weeks, but it's worked really well in the past few months. And so, so I'm, and also, I've, the, the bond market's different than it used to be. It used to be that there was f- ferocious volumes of trading. But then the regulators came in with, you know, Dodd-Frank and Elizabeth Warren and all that stuff, and they, they piled on a whole bunch of regulations, and electronic trading has become much more prevalent. And so the volume of trading has collapsed. So there are times when liquidity 
is really good. This is one of those times. September was the largest bond issuance in American history, largest corporate bond issuance in particular, and yet they were, it was oversubscribed. People wanted even more. So there's tremendous liquidity. But then there's moments where something goes wrong and you can't even get a bid. So you need to use these moments of liquidity to be moving into more liquid, more getting out of the liquid things into liquid things, and also pairing the stuff that has serious economic exposure risks, like triple C corporates and stuff like that, which they're all incredibly expensive. The, this, this, is, this moment is the most expensive non-energy. We take out energy because it's really volatile. Um, if, if you take energy out of corporate bonds, the, the extra you get for buying corporate bonds is the le least it's ever been in history, ever, if you take out energy. Uh, and I think there's a reason for that. I, I think that this idea that I have that maybe you can't trust the government with their debt management, I think that that supports the idea that corporates should yield the least ever extra. Because when I started my career, there were corporate bonds that traded at lower yields than treasury bonds because people were worried about what they thought was you know, Reagan's ridiculous economic policy. It was IBM, for example. IBM bonds offered lower yield than the same treasury bond. And it was because people didn't trust the government. And that, this is... See, the, the, the whole thing about investing is, is trying to figure out, you, you, you think you understand this, that how, do this, how does it all fit together? How does it all fit together is something that is impossible to teach. You, you, either, you either are interested in that way of thinking and, and capable of it, or you're not interested in, that thing, oh, in it or incapable of it. And so I, I do a lot of that, that sort of a thing. I call it, a lot of my, people ask me, hey, you, I saw you at a speech and you said you were super bullish on 30-year treasury bonds, you know, five years ago. How come you didn't own anything but that? And I say, you just simply don't understand a thing about investing. <laughs> you cannot take fatal risks. And when you're managing other people's money, you're going to have problems. This is one of the things I try to teach the young people. Begin with saying, I know I'm going to be wrong from time to time. That's where you start. Make sure it's not fatal. Don't make fatal mistakes. So if you buy nothing but the 30-year treasury bond, you, you could have your name up in lights if you're right, but you're out of business if you're wrong. Right. Never take a portfolio mix. You start out thinking about your portfolio and say, how am I approaching this? Now let's assume that I'm wrong. It's going to be bad, but how bad? Will we be able to survive this? No, you know, no fatal risk. That's what double line means. There's, there is a thing in the real world called, with a double line. It's called a road. And you're not allowed to cross it or get, you get a ticket. But it's not really that they want revenue. It's they're trying to protect you from getting head on as you go around a turn on a windy road. So the whole idea of double line is no fatal risk. You don't cross the double line. And that, that, that also means that you have to think about if I'm doing this particular activity in part of the portfolio, what can I do that if I'm wrong, this will work? And so that together, we can dampen the volatility of the overall. So I've been in this business, like I said, over 40 years. I'm wrong 30% of the time. That's over 10 years of wrong. It's actually over 12 years of wrong. So I've been wrong a lot. So my competitors always like to say, oh, Gunlock's wrong again. I, I say, yeah, sure, okay. But I haven't been, but I'm right 70% of the time. And that's, that's a money machine if you can keep that going. And so the, the, the job is to try to keep that going.